Hello, Abby. Thank you very much for dialing in today. Welcome to SRI Connect's call with the Climate Bonds Initiative. My name is Mike Tyrrell. I'm the editor of SRI Connect. For those of you who haven't yet experienced the platform, it's an independent research platform for sustainability and corporate governance research for investors. I'm an equities man, convinced that environmental and social factors will have an ever greater impact on the valuation of equities, but not really interested in bonds. I can't really be bothered with them. Or I couldn't until I was recently asked to speak on the subject and address it. In the course of looking into it, I'm something of a convert. I became convinced that the climate bonds are, in fact, a particularly interesting area of development, and what I wanted to hear more about, and by extension, that it would be interesting for you to hear more about. Thank you so much for calling in today. I feel boring than listening to a convert. And the news is you're not going to have to listen to me anymore, because we've got one of the experts on the subject, we have Jit Ball from the Climate Bonds Initiative, who is going to take us through a 20-minute presentation and then leave 25 minutes for your questions on any subject related to climate bonds. Over to you, Bridget. Thank you very much, Mike. It's uh, very good to hear that you're, you're a convert, and hopefully we can make some more today and uh, convert you all into the very interesting world of bonds, and particularly climate bonds. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, just to give you a bit of background, the Climate Bonds Initiative is an investor-focused, not-for-profit based in London. Our main aim is to mobilise debt capital markets for climate change solutions. And uh, we're supported by an advisory panel all over the world. Uh, we focused on climate change, obviously, because it's a pressing issue. And, uh, so, but we see it really an urgency. We avoid two, two degrees. And so that investment needs to start taking place right now. And for that, we need finance. And also because the infrastructure and technological requirements to address climate change are quite well understood, obviously, would, um, I'm sure there's great technology out there um, that yet to discover, but they're largely understood. And that is quite different to some other social and environmental challenges that are very important, um, but where the solutions are not as well defined. So in that way, climate change is as much a financing t challenge as it is a technological um, challenge. And so, so that's our big focus. Focus. Um, our agenda, you can see it on the slides in front of you. We want to establish a thematic market at scale, thematic market being um, related or environmental, and, uh, and to really that be at the scale that investors want to invest in, so each product at a scale that investors can invest in it, um, so not small products, and that the market is something that uh, many investors can participate in. And ensure the trust about the green credentials of the market, that this isn't a you know, greenwash market, but that actually the bonds out there are genuinely addressing climate change. So the pipeline of investment opportunities um, and to support bonds as an exit opportunity for banks and equities to, uh, to do more with less. And I'll, I'll go into a bit more of that later. Six. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, climate bonds are, uh, are bonds whose proceeds are for emissions reduction or adaptation. We split the market into two parts, the labelled market, so that includes all those bonds that have been marketed as green, and in their bond documentation, the use of proceeds is stated as green. Um, and that the labelled market being bonds that meet that criteria, so the proceeds are being used used to finance emissions reduction or adaptation, but they're not labelled and marketed as such. So this includes um, companies all around the world, pure play companies, perhaps in renewable energy or in energy efficiency um, or in perhaps sustainable transport, who are issuing a bond um, to finance a particular project that we would define as green, but they haven't marketed as such. Um, who can them? Well, bond issuing entity, governments, corporations, multilateral development banks, municipalities. And in terms of the types of bonds, we have loosely two parts, asset-linked or asset-backed. Asset-linked is the term we use to describe any bonds where the proceeds are going towards a particular project or asset, but the bond is not backed by that asset alone. So the bond is backed by the corporate balance sheet issuer, um, and so it, it doesn't rely on a, on a project or an asset paying back in order to back the investors. Um, and then asset-backed would be the opposite of that, 
where it is particular the proceeds um, or the payback of the bond is linked to the infrastructure or the asset, and and that those can take different forms. Project bonds are one of them, um, and asset backed securities are another. The best practice for issuers in the space um, to be able to call their bond green we need to have projects um, or assets behind that bond that um, are recognized as green or as environmental or as a related by a recognized set of definitions or experts um, then the next step for best practice would be that they cash that they have some kind of cash flow tracking um, so in other words that the money going to where they say it is going towards, and that that is signed off by an auditor, and that the whole thing is signed off by a third party would be very best practice. So in other words, it, the part of the bond, and also the sort of greenness part or the environmental credibility of the bond. And that is the, the best practice for issuers. So opportunity for bonds. <clears throat> I see bonds um, as having a huge opportunity for capital steerage, and and that means that they have the ability to actually shift capital directly towards areas of the economy um, or in, in areas that um, that we that we are specify or that are specified by the government or whoever else. So because they, they, you can link the use of proceeds directly in the bond documentation or elsewhere, they can link to particular assets. Um, in the past, they've been used by governments to run for areas such as sewer infrastructure, railways, and even wars. And that's been a particular tool that governments have, been used, have used um, to finance infrastructure. But they can equally be used as a positive investment tool for social for social aims or social goods or environmental aims or environmental goods. And in, in that, that's where we're talking about, particularly in this webinar, climate change solutions and infrastructure. And um, so really this means that, that we really see them as a positive investment tool. And this is slightly separate from the very important um, discussion that's going on on the integration of ESG risks into fixed income portfolios, um, which is a very important discussion, but we're really talking here about green bonds as an opportunity for a positive investment strategy, um, and that they um, are being used to shift capital, and that this capital really has an impact, so a genuine contribution towards climate change. Um, and clearly, they could be used in other areas. You could you could have a social bond. Um, the World Bank have issued immunisation bonds. Um, there, there are other ways that you can use this tool because so, bonds are just a, a tool, um, and they can be used otherwise. And as long as the project can be structured in a way that suits a bond payback, they can be used in other ways. But we see climate change as a particular urgency. So what does this mean, this sort of asset rather than issuers? Um, this means that, the, that we're really looking at how the asset has an, an impact rather than the issuer. So companies um, for example, which might have a sort of neural or perhaps even low, lower ESG rating, um, say, for example, a utility which has exposure to coal, um, be able to issue green bonds in order to the renewable part of their business. And therefore, investors who might not invest in the equity have a chance to invest directly in the part of the business that, um, that is changing. And so they are really shifting capital towards that area. This means that Companies with good ratings, um, ESG ratings, might not be able, eligible to issue a green bond, um, as it's it's not really linked to ESG policies and management systems. Although this is certainly a good thing, um, but really it's re linked to impact. So unless the company had particular projects in place, like putting solar panels on their rooftops or increasing energy efficiency across their industrial system or across their buildings. Um, they would not necessarily, they wouldn't really be eligible to issue a green bond just on the basis of the fact that they are um, have a good have a good ESG rating. Um, investors can they then decide how, how they want to use this. Um, some investors, for example, decided with the EDF bond that was issued last year, um, the, the bond was linked to the growth of the renewables business, and some investors saw this as an opportunity to invest in growing that part of EDF's business. And investors um, were concerned because of the exposure EDF has to nuclear with the rest of the company. So investors um, 
then make their own decisions on top of know what the what the asset is. Um, the asset, the the market is huge, as you can see, that it's around about 80 trillion at least, and um, 60 percent of the assets under management by institutional institutional investors is in bonds. So really, it's just such a huge part um, of the investment world, and really important to be addressed. And to put uh, the climate solution in context, one trillion per year is needed to address global climate change above the business as usual. This is according to the um, IE. So, um, so that just puts those figures in context. The point I'd like to make is that when we're talking about bonds, this is actually a, a much bigger world than just companies. A huge um, slice of the bond market is actually in sovereign bonds, in supranational bonds, um, municipalities, financial institutions. And so actually corporate bonds is, is a fairly small portion um, of the market. And this asset over issuer argument we've been talking about when it comes to green bonds is really important when it comes to sovereigns and supranationals who can't really be evaluated at an, at an issue level. Um, so that, that concept becomes even more clear when it comes to them. Moving on, <clears throat> look at the market size. Um, towards the end of the last year, the label market stood at about $20 billion. It's a bit big than that now, but about $20 billion outstanding. Um, and this, this is compared to our estimate of the unlabeled market, which is about $346 billion. And due to release new figures on that really shortly. Um, our report last year split that 346 up, and you can see in what sectors that fell into, transport being very dominant, um, and energy there. But really very small, even compared to the potential market size. Um, the labeled market that I have here doesn't include sovereigns. Um, it doesn't include any companies that are not pure play within a certain sector, unless they've labeled their, labeled their bonds. So the potential market is huge, and, and we expect to see a great deal of growth from that. From there. Having a look at um, what's happened so far in, in the green labeled market, um, started off quite slowly, as you can see, from 2007 um, to 2012, with just a small bump in 2010, um, and then really exploded last year, um, and we expect to see even bigger growth this year. So we started mostly by... Um, multiple development banks, in particular the EIB and World Bank, um, using the asset-linked model. The corporate issuance um, has started in the last six months, really, towards the end of 2013. Uh, it started a very classic uh, bond market growth with high ratings, all the MDBs with AAA ratings. And as the corporate market is starting to open up, the, we're going down the ratings bands and, and having with greater yield. Um, the future growth is definitely from corporates and asset backed. Um, hu the huge opportunity for corporates was shown last year with the EDF bond, <clears throat> their first foray into the market, and it was this bond that had been issued to date at that time. So it shows the hu huge potential for much and much larger bonds. Um, just another thing on that, that the uh, amount issued to date this year is around $4 billion, and we're only in March, so there's definitely um, signs that this is going to be a much um, big year. So what did next? Um, we really need clear definitions. Listen, as the issuer base broadens beyond MDBs, which have really been seen as trusted issuers, that we trust that what, whatever it says on the tin is, is what's happening with the bond and is, goes towards corporates and others. Um, so, that's, so we really need... Um, Definitions for for that to um, to be created. We need definitions to be able to address difficult areas. What happens if somebody wants to issue a hydro bond or a fuels green bond or water green bond? What are our definitions on what makes that what, what that have an impact? Um, you know, we all know the controversy surrounding biofuels. But are there any that would have a genuinely good impact on um, on climate change? Um, to second and third generation, for example. Um, to market credibility for issuers and for investors, investors knowing what they're buying and issuers um, issuing that they know they're not going to come up with any issues in the future because they've followed certain standards. And what's needed for that? Well, investors need to look a bit under the hood of each bond and see what's coming up, especially as the market is growing. 
see see what's actually in that bond. We need to encourage issuers to use third-party standards and third-party verifiers, and they can contribute to the debate. We need to collaborate together and work really towards a common set of definitions, or at least a, a broad set of criteria on what can it what is it to be called a green bond and what kind of criteria needs to be followed. For issuers to define use of proceeds and bond documentation, um, to use recognized green and climate definitions, and then to get their bond certified. In terms of um, definitions, that's just a, a broad set of the climate bonds, um, what we call our green definitions that we're trying to come up with. We're working with um, academic institutions, technical experts, and other NGOs, and, and investors to come up with a, a set of definitions that are broad across the whole economy rather than just energy or energy efficiency. And really looking at what are all the investments that we need to create a low carbon economy. And, and that's the start of it, and we're, and we're busy working on that. One last development I'd like to mention is the green bonds principles. They were released at the beginning of this year after a lot of work last year by a number of banks um, who have issued, uh, who have listed over here. They, they have two kind of quite important characteristics. The one that the, they emphasize is that this is about assets and not companies. <clears throat> it must be backed by a um, well, the, the bond must be backed by a project or an asset that is seen as meeting an environmental aim. And that the, they emphasize the importance of transparency and reporting. And that, that we could, so we can see how the bond is being tracked and what it's being used for. Our own contribution to those that the green bonds principles don't set out to determine what is green or what is climate. They, um, that is not their area of expertise, and they have a number of um, listed in the appendix, um, including which um, references different um, companies or def sets of definitions that can be used to determine that, and including what the EIB uses and the IFC uses, and as well as as, um, the Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, so we have uh, a, a station system in place that takes these definitions and certifies that the issuer um, assets are in line with them and that the cash flow tracking is going, in, going to those areas. So, um, so just what's happening, what we're doing in that space to ensure trust. Um, for that, so that wrap my uh, my 20 minutes um but please find us on sri connect follow us on twitter we've also got a blog that we release lots of information about um, new bonds that are coming out and any market developments and you can sign up on our website you can see the web address there thank you very much mike and uh over to questions thank you bridget yes an excellent and uh, very concise overview of, of a complex area and um, we've got a few questions coming through um if you already answered them this one. When the market sizing report going to be released? That will be released. The numbers should be out within the next week. And the full report um, will be out by the end of April. Thank you. And we have a question here um, on how how do you see the role of sustainability rating agencies? Um, well, sustainability rating agencies are really important in markets. Um, firstly. In terms of what we're doing in defining um, assets, how assets are meeting climate change goals, um, sustainability agencies are very useful in um, providing a broader picture of that. Um, there's the other issues with the projects or the issuer that are environmental or socially related that um, that we might we would like to combine with sustainability ratings agency to be able to pick up. It's not our of expertise, um, and it's not something we see ourselves going into. So, um, really, then very important to fleshing out that picture and having that broader, um, that broad remit to be able to look at those issues. Um, sustainability rating agencies have also been involved in um, in having a look at some of the bonds and uh, and providing some um, some sorts of criteria as well for particular projects covering their ESG issues, uh, and so they're very important in that way as well and, and key to the development of the market and we really hope that, um, it, that they, the fact that there is obviously competition between them that um, there will also be some sort of consensus between um, ratings agencies and NGOs about what it takes to be called in bond and broad criteria on that. So they are really important in this market. 
some core some core agreement about uh, what a bond is, and then mm. perhaps competition over who can deliver the services or, exactly. or the pricing. Exactly. Um, we're from the other side now. So the question here, while, while we run others, if I was a company and I wanted to issue a gold standard green bond, green bond. Mm -hmm. Sorry for mixing my colours. <laughs> and have it certified. What process would I go through? Well, you would uh, have take the assets or projects that you're looking to um, through the through the bond, and make sure that they meet different by recognised. Meet the criteria of a recognised set of definitions. So perhaps the definitions that Climate Bonds has, or um, or using another organisation, and, uh, and then you could have it certified. And that certification really involved has two parts to it. The first is the the sort of green environmental part, and that is uh, making sure that the you know, project is actually fitting within the set of definitions. So if it's um, biofuels, you know, project which could be quite controversial. You know, is it is it an impact as defined um, by the experts out there, or some um, hydropower? You know, also quite controversial. Same thing. And then, um, then the other part of the certification is to have a look at the financial tracking and and an organisation um, with experience in that. Certainly not ourselves, but we use others. Um, would would make sure that the company has the the issuer has has the systems in place to be able to track the funds um, and so that we know the money where the money is going, where it says it is, and that they have systems in place to report on that. Thank you. We have a question here from, a, I, I suspect, a banker interested in structuring the bond. I um, ask, to what extent are in, investors focused on the definition of green and adjusting their investment strategies? So, so the investors perspective, are they just relying on third party certification or are they taking their own views on what sort of uh, bond they consider to meet a standard or not? Uh, it's quite hard to say at this stage um, how investors are reacting and as you're probably aware, each each investor has its own um, set of internal standards. Some of them have bigger teams and are able to do more due diligence on each bond. Um, have uh, have much less ability to do this, um, and so maybe looking into each bond. But um, so more generally, though, um, I would say that when at the moment there isn't kind of a single standard or a single um, type of certification or a single organisation that is um, kind of put out there to do the due diligence for investors, and I think that is really something that investors are looking for, is so that they don't have to do all the due diligence themselves. Um, in terms of how they're how they're looking at it, um, that um, each bond is at the moment very heavily oversubscribed. So there is a lot of demand out there, and this could indicate that just about anything would be bought. Now we, we are sure investors are more sophisticated than that, um, but it's it's quite difficult to tell at this stage of the market, um, which is small and growing. Um, how how investors look at the issues and uh, and whether in fact we might need a, a scandal of some sort to, ha to happen to really make investors think oh you know there is a potential green rush in this area so that that's um, that's a quite a difficulty and so um, yeah there's there's definitely a need for uh, for due diligence to be done for investors and uh, rather than you know, self certifying it themselves. Um, and uh, and so hopefully that that will develop more and more as the market grows. But certainly at this stage, um, it's difficult to tell each individual investor's mandate. I mean, from looking at the bonds, we can have it, we can see broadly how many SRI investors were invested in each one, and this level varies quite a lot from 100% SRI investors to say 40%. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the ones with 40% are of less credible for SRI investors. It might have mean that it was a bigger institution with a more global reach and uh, and attracted more mainstream investors. It's quite difficult to tell from that perspective. But as the market grows and as we find our feet, I think <clears throat> the, the issues will become more clear to investors uh, and where there are any problems, um, the areas of due diligence will be picked up on as well. Challenge in there's a spectrum of different bonds and also a spectrum of different investor interests and Definitely. not quite enough in between the two to, to start sorting sorting mm -hmm. different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's a sort of similar question to what you touched on earlier. Um, is there a risk that environmentally controversial companies might use green bonds uh, to finance projects in an attempt to greenwash? An example given an oil company using a green bond mm. to finance a different farm. I mean, that, that is a risk. Um, I think in extreme cases, like an oil company financing a wind farm, um, I don't think the risk is that high. Um, I think investors are definitely sophisticated enough and have learned enough about greenwash to be able to pick, pick those ones out that um, they can see with greenwash. Um, I think that, that that risk is probably not that high in, in those extremes. And, you know, ratings from um, your ratings agencies can definitely assist with that, especially in those extreme cases. In the middle, um, so in the kind of less clear-cut cases, that that's certainly greenwash. I think it, it, it certainly is a potential. I think I see it as less of an issue um, because the whole idea with green bonds is that we know where the money is going towards, and that is so it makes genuine impact towards change. So if it meets those definitions, that it is making a genuine impact, then then I think that 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 all companies who have kind of neutral um, Kind of ability to greenwash and don't have a huge high impact like say an oil company would and I don't see the risk as, as high so certainly yeah there is greenwashing opportunity but I think it's um, less of an, a risk than in equities where you have a kind of clear metrics um, and sometimes companies have lots of different things so it's quite difficult to sort out those different those different risks so yeah it is a risk but I, do, I don't think it's um, a huge issue at this stage. Okay. Thank you. And another question about market size and shape. You mentioned a split of bonds by sector. Are you able to give any granularity on the geographic split? Any regions or any countries that are particularly active in this market? Yes, I can. Um, I can also direct you to the report we have on our website. Um, this is last year's report and hopefully the new one coming out fairly soon. The um, main issuing markets um well, the regions of regions, Europe, North America, Japan are the big um, markets, and also China has a very big uh, very, issue, a lot of bonds linked to uh, sustainable in transport infrastructure. Um, so that, that actually is a huge market, although um, not always open to foreign investors. <clears throat> um, I would say to, um, although you have quite good geographical splits, um, to add two caveats to that, and the, and the one is that the, the uh, metric that we use is the um, registered country of, of the issuer. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the money being spent is in the country that we have. Um, that just means that, that is where the issuer is based. Um, in many cases, that is where the money is going. Um, a lot of um, transport companies are based in a single tree and so that, or a single region, and so that is where the money is going. Um, and the second caveat to that is uh, that uh, you know, there are big markets and the bond markets are in Japan, Europe, and North America. So um, there is obviously a bias towards these big markets. It doesn't mean that there isn't, there isn't stuff happening elsewhere, but those are, that is the big bias towards the big bond issuing markets. Okay. Um, two more questions now. Um, uh, I'm slightly intrigued by this question of controversy. On one hand, you don't want a controversy, but on the other hand, it might drive better definitions. Do um, you think we need a control now? To what degree would this damage the market and to what degree would it help? Uh, so it's, a diff it's a difficult one. And some days I think I'm finally going, well, we'd love a controversy if we want a, bit, a better definition. And on other days I think, well, <clears throat> that would really damage the market. And I think on most days that would, that would be my opinion, um, is that really damage the market and, and be quite detrimental at this really early stage. Um, we, we've had experience um, from Greenwash in in equities and, and elsewhere that uh, and we can see that can damage the market and damage credibility and so really we don't want that, that to happen um, especially knowing the lessons we've learned so in the deal world we've learned those lessons with the market is growing out, you know the labelled market is only 20 billion dollars so it's very, very small and uh, and so we we know where to go we have a, a reasonable set of definitions in place and, uh, and so the best way forward would be be you know for not to be a, def, uh, a controversy and uh, and for us to for, you know those the we think the market would develop best um, using the definitions that we have available the organisations that we have available the rating 
things that we have available to us at the moment. So hopefully that is the way that it, it will go. Um, but, you know, markets can hijacked by, by different interests, by different parties, and so it, it doesn't always mean it's going to happen. And certainly uh, a controversy might, might spark some debate um, and, uh, you know, and get, and get investors thinking about um, about what kind of decisions we need. But hopefully women like this can uh, can help us to do that rather than a big controversy. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're staying on the positive theme. Um, what should we be looking for this year in terms of collaboration? What do we need to see from the investment banks and the Climate Bonds Initiative by the 2014? Well, I think a common set of definitions which have been talked about would be really, really great to have some kind of um, collaboration from uh, banks, from NGOs, from issuers on, on what we see as green. And the, the, um, the advanced principles certainly made a start to that. And that's a line and framework for what you know, best practice on, on how a bond is issued. But we'd also like to see a bit more collaboration on, on what, that, um, what that bond should look like from, from an environmental perspective. And so um, certainly this year is going to be a lot about collaboration in that area. Um, the banks investment banks are important to this market and they are driving driving deals and seeing the growth in this market as a huge business opportunity that's great for the market um, because you know, it's not just NGOs like us pushing growth but it's uh, really um, banks and others so it's uh, that's a very positive thing for the market but um, as we know banks don't have the highest level of credibility at the moment so um, we hope they don't you know go over as it were, and uh, and and self allow issuers to self-certify, or for for banks to determine what is uh, what is and what isn't climate-related. So um, so that collaboration between investment banks and uh, and NGOs and ratings agencies and others is um, and maintaining that relationship is very important in the coming year, and we're going to see a lot of growth in the coming year. So uh, as that growth explodes, that keeping those relationships um, is very important. And finally, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, how can we follow up on the impact of a project? Impacts are not always easy to understand. Is it a challenge in relation to the cost of bond administration? Yes, it is a challenge. Um, I would first say that there are some areas where the impact monitoring and monitoring is probably more important than in others. So in, in energy efficiency, for example, that is really important that you know, a building is is all these things are into it, but what you know, what is the actual output of the building? Is it, is it saving energy? Um, and could that could be, you know, slightly costly, but um, but that that is what's needed in that space. In renewables, slightly less so. Um, you know, once something is built, if it's been checked that it's been built, it's grid connected, um, and that you know, there's probably not as much monitoring and verification that needs to take place. So there there are sort of different levels of of um, Modern verification post bond issuance that need to take place. Some are more costly than others, um, and so you know, hopefully on balance, it isn't a huge cost to the in investor. Um, but you know, if uh, to the issuer at least, um, but if it is what the investor is demanding, you know, more transparency and better reporting, then that is just what it takes to issue um, a, a green bond. So you know, issuers will have to take this into consideration. Um, we're in that you know the more bonds that an issuer issues, um, the less the, the less costly it becomes. The you know the systems that they have in place will be to deal with this, um, and that will become cheaper for them. And so, so hopefully that cost will be pushed over time. The cost of certification might also come down over time um, as this becomes easier. Um, yes, if if that is what is being demanded of them, then that is something that they'll have to factor into when deciding whether to issue a green bond. So those are all, all part of the challenges, but not something that we can't overcome. Thank you very much. The questions keep coming, but um, we are keen to establish and maintain a reputation for keeping these calls short and sharp. <laughs> so I'm going to cut it off there. Um, I suspect this will be the last time we have a call on this subject. So thank you very much for your contribution. Um, people you. who want to continue the, the discussion, obviously professional investors and research providers can register with www.sri-connect.com and select as one of their interests to the class of bonds. You can obviously follow uh, her team's work at www.climatebonds.net or on Twitter 
uh, as you can see in the screen in front of you. Thank you very much for your time. If anybody has any further questions or indeed like calls on similar subjects, then please do let me know. But mate, thanks for listening and thank you, Bridget, for, for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Mike.